All right. So uh, tonight is going to be the second part of the uh, two-part uh, digital and network connected repeaters. Um, just as a reminder of where we're at here, um, last month we talked uh, pretty much around um, using um, IP links, microwave links between repeater sites, um, the theory behind that, what the goals of some of linking with repeaters are in general. And then tonight we're gonna to go into some of the details on how we've grafted some of these systems uh, together um, and uh, you know how repeaters can be modified to uh, uh, do network connected or digital repeaters. And uh, those are not uh, the same thing. Uh, you can definitely do network connected analog FM, which we've done quite a bit of. Uh, with that, John, do you remember exactly which slide we left off on? Did we get uh, through the, did we get through the, uh, operating in emergencies? We got the sites. I think we got through like that one, maybe, uh, it might've been this. Yeah, I think we left off right around here. Yeah, I think so too. All right. Well, we'll jump right in here. So, um, <clears throat> The two types of networking um, that we're, we're talking about here, uh, one of which is all star. Uh, and then the other one um, is is pi star really because of pi star the platform, although obviously there are other uh, similar technologies um, that do some of the digital repeater connecting. Um, some of the nice things about all star um, all star is a naturally peer to peer network. So for emergencies, uh, you don't have to have the support of a central service to uh, connect these. Um, you know, with the digital modes, uh, you have to have a directory service. Um, some of them do require a central routing system. Uh, in particular, DMR, for example, um, you have to send everything up to the sea bridge and back down. Um, so. You know, with All Star, you can create ad hoc links um, that are naturally peer to peer. Um, so, for example, all of the repeaters on the Megalink use um, 44 net IP addresses, um, which is a, a ham project called Ampernet, uh, which goes back to the early 80s uh, when amateurs were doing um, IP based experimentation for uh, different network connected technologies. Um, all of our repeaters have a quote unquote public IP address, so we don't have to fool around with um, natting or port forwarding. Um, if you set it up right, your All-Star node is uh, reachable by everybody. Uh, All-Star is trivially commanded with DTMF to do the things that you normally want to do, such as link and unlink. It's really just a quick star command to link or unlink. Um, you can also set up macros, uh, for example, if you wanted to connect all the Northeast Ohio all-star nodes in an emergency together, you could set up a macro to do that. Um, one of the other great things about all-star is since it is doing FM analog and is doing natural um, wave or wave like natural audio waves, um, you can do uh, interesting things like send MT632K over all-star linked repeaters. Um, that is not something you can do in any of the digital modes. So that's a pretty interesting concept where you could link repeaters and instead of try to talk across them, you could talk across, you could send uh, data traffic, MT63 data traffic across them. Um, for PyStar in an emergency, uh, the same thing, we do have public IP addressing for everything. Um, so at least our stuff doesn't need directory lookups. We can code everything to hook up together. Um, that's not universally true, but that's some of the stuff that we've done. Um, for our reflector, um, at the moment, this slide is not, this bullet point on the slide is not true. At the moment, the reflector is sitting in my basement uh, because uh, it was having a problem getting hot. And when it was getting hot, it was screwing up the um, vo the vocoder chip that transcodes the audio between the different digital modes. And John and I got tired of driving out to Doylestown to power cycle a Pi. So at the moment, it is sitting downstairs in my basement. Um, the other thing is um, there's really only one, maybe one and a half protocols that would work well in a disaster, no internet situation. 
Um, D star um, is definitely can be definitely connected um, site to site. Um, there are some limitations there with how many you could really realistically connect together, but it does work. Um, system fusion, um, depending on the connection type you have may work because some of them use the internet, some of them use a downloaded directory. Um, you, you could not use DMR as you would need the um, fully functional Brandmeister Seabridge network. So any questions on the uh, operating and emergency slide, I guess. Hello, oh, it's Eric WD8KNL. I would take exception to the DMR comment. I mean, the DMR repeaters can talk to their own brand over a net if it's viable. They don't need to have a C bridge, but certainly interconnecting multiple vendors would require that. Right, yeah. So I guess we were talking pretty much exclusively about PyStar, but you're you're right, Eric. If you have like a Motorola, you know, those those can talk to each other natively. All right. John, you want to take this one? Yeah, with uh, All Star Link, we'll dive into that a little bit, get into some more details on it. Um, it is also runs on a Raspberry Pi, like pretty much everything else that Jason and I have done in the last two years, <laughs> outside of work at least. Um, it is a Raspberry Pi running on the Asterix PBX. And if you've never heard of Asterix, you've probably at least used it before. It's um, one of the most common uh, uh, business phone system uh, backends around. Even some of the ones that you pay money for end up with Asterix underneath it. So this is the thing that, you know, the, the receptionist that has multiple lines on her phone and voicemail and can uh, conference call and all that kind of stuff. That's what Asterix was really built to do as an open source platform. All Star is just a module that plugs into that. So they, they took that Asterix software that was made as a phone PBX package um, and then added links to handle uh, FM radio things. So audio in and out, um, uh, things like COS and push to talk were added into the Asterix piece through this module. So it's, it's just a little piece that snaps into an existing package that's been around for, geez, I don't know, 20 years probably. Um, All-Star Link can be controlled entirely with DTMF codes. You can also do it from a, um, a uh, command prompt on the, on the device, but uh, DTMF codes are just fine for most things. And it's pretty easy to put together on just about any sort of radio stack. Um, we've used old Motorola Radius radios, uh, Yesu System Fusion repeaters running in analog mode, um, uh, Yesu radios, just you know standard mobiles, uh, you name it, you can plug it in. If you can get audio in and out of it and you know, a push to talk in COS, that's just about all you need. The other thing uh, that it does for you is uh, All Star Link comes with Echo Link support built into it as well. So if you Convert a repeater to All Star. Uh, you can add Echo Link right into that. It's just a configuration thing. You don't need any extra hardware or software. It all comes in that package. I go ahead and hit the next slide here, Jason. Yeah. So this is just a couple examples of um, what large All Star networks can look like. Um, the picture on the left. Um, is the Western Intertie, um, which is a very centralized system. As you can see, um, everything kind of points towards that one central hub. Uh, the other one uh, on the right is, uh, is a network that's in, in Britain. Um, this is the M0HOY Hubnet network. Um, this network has about five or six different leafs to it. Um, and the interesting thing about how this all puts together is these are all peer-to-peer um, -peer connections. So um, for example, if you, uh, let's say this is you and you dialed in to this hub and then you key up, 
every repeater in this cluster gets a distributed signal um, rather than a centralized signal uh, to key up. So it'll go here and split, and then it'll go up to this one and split, and it'll go all the way up to this one and split, and so on. So, and, and the nice thing about this being based on um, a telephony protocol is uh, real time is very important with this. So from keying up here to when this repeater opens up way up here um, is very, very fast. Um, so the interesting thing there is you can create these ad hoc networks um, and it scales very well. Um, there's, there's very little delay, you know, assuming you're, you know, some of these hubs, you know, people who are running hubs usually have them sufficiently sized. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to create these types of topologies. Any questions on the all-star meshing? All right, this one's you, John. All right, so this is a, a layout of what a typical all-star repeater looks like. It's, it's a block diagram of, of what you see. In fact, the one we're looking at here is the Sarah's 3.9 repeater. Um, gives you an idea, we'll store it over on the left side. The BCR50, uh, you'll see the green is the receiver radio and the red is the transmit radio. That's the Bridgecom repeater. So the, the, you know, repeaters are just transmitters and receivers uh, hooked together, really. And, and that's the receive radio and the transmit radio inside the Bridgecom repeater. Um, we've run the receive audio out of that. And, uh, and we got a little out of control to, to improve some of the characteristics of it. But we've added a, a MyCore squelch board. Uh, if you remember the late, I think it's late 70s, the Motorola MyCore has the most um, I don't know if it's famous or infamous squelch system known. Uh, it automatically adjusts if you've ever listened to 3.9. If somebody has a really strong signal, when they let off of the um, push to talk button, you don't hear any squelch tail. You know, it's a, it's a very fast squelch. Whereas if somebody's noisy and they're, they have flutter on their signal, when they let go, you'll hear a very loose squelch on the end of that. That's the magic of the MyCore squelch board. It, it does that probably better than just about anything else since. Um, so we've added that into the repeater to, to improve that a little bit. Um, we're doing PL encode and decode on that communication specialist board. That's another little outboard board that's on there. Um, the orange box there toward the middle is essentially a sound card. So it's a, uh, uh, I should have brought in one in one, here that uh, we could look at, but it's essentially a USB sound card. It has audio in and out, uh, but it also has push to talk and COS lines on it. But other than that, it's really no different than, than any um, sound card that you would have. And then finally, all that goes into, you guessed it, a Raspberry Pi over on the right. Um, and, and that is essentially the 3.9 repeater is what we're looking at there. Um, there is no other controller. There's no extra outboard um, SCOM or uh, ACOM or uh, RLC or any of the you know CAT controllers. The Raspberry Pi is doing everything, the courtesy tones, the timeouts, all that stuff. And then what, uh, if you kept going to the right of that diagram, you would see there's also an ethernet cable that plugs in and that's what puts the whole thing on the network. So without the network, this would function just fine on its own. Uh, but then that also is running Asterix and All Star on the Raspberry Pi, and then that's what connects it up to the network to interconnect all the other systems. Another example, uh, this is a little bit different way of doing it. So this is Marty's 53.17 repeater. Um, you'll notice on the left side, again, we have a radio. In this case, it's a GE Master 2 receiver and transmitter. Um, in Marty's case, he has a very conventional CAT 1000 repeater controller. Those have been for sale for, geez, I don't know, 25 years probably. And um, that's what runs the repeater on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and then basically grafted onto that, we've connected the same thing we have on 3.9. There's the uh, DMK URI, which is the, uh, the sound card interface to a Raspberry Pi. So in the case of Marty's repeater, 
the the day-to-day -day repeater operation, timeout and courtesy tones and that sort of thing, all comes from that Cat 1000 controller. And then as a uh, the Raspberry Pi and sound card are, are treated like a remote base radio, really. Um, so those those are grafted on there. It's a different way of doing it. Yeah, and we should mention, you know, Sarah helped um, the Wayne Amateur Radio Club with their repeater earlier. Well, I guess going back to 2019, I was going to say earlier this year, but <laughs> it's been a little bit longer than that. And this is exactly the same way that um, 147.21 is set up. So they have a um, Yesu uh, system fusion radio with a... Um, uh, uh, SCOM, a SCOM 7330. And then the, um, the, way, the way they have it set up is that the repeater is on one port and then the Raspberry Pi with the audio interface is on a second port. And then they have them mixed together in the SCOM. Um, and that works really well, except for the poor squelch on the uh, system fusion. But we're, we're working on Gary, the other Gary, the other president Gary, uh, maybe someday we'll talk him into replacing the, uh, <laughs> putting an inline squelch board. <laughs> Any questions on either of those uh, layouts? Yeah, I was going to ask that interface board that you were talking about, is that kind of like that little board that you had uh, Gary and myself build? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, uh, it's uh, it's good you brought that up. So historically, the the big player in this space was in fact DMK. Um, they have a very very nice package um, for the URIX. The downside is it's a very expensive package just to get a USB connected sound card. Um, Masters Communications is a little one man operation, two man operation. Yep, and then he he actually makes a series of boards, the RA series of boards. That's an RA25 that Stefan's holding up, and they they go up to I think it's the RA45 or the RA50. I can't remember now. Um, and when you get up to the larger ones, um, where the DMK is all very software driven and has um, different you know amplifiers and logic lines, uh, the RA board is very hardware driven. Um, all your adjustments are with trim pots and things like that. Um, so, and that RA25 board is fairly inexpensive. It might actually be $25 <laughs> or $30 or something like that. Um, so it's a much cheaper entry point and they work really well. If you don't need a lot of fine audio adjustment, um, they work really well for hotspots and repeaters. Um, you know, if we were ever to use one for your, if we ever replaced the DMK, it'd probably be the RA45 just so we have all the little pots to fiddle with because you know, nothing says repeaters like fiddling with all the little knobs to dial in exactly the way you want it to be. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, thanks Stefan, that's exactly what it is. Cool. Any other questions, thoughts, hatreds? All right, um, so some pros and cons of All-Star. Um, the, the strongest pro, in our opinion, for, for All-Star is that it's standard analog FM. Um, and you, you don't need any special radio, any digital radio, anything other than whatever HT mobile base radio you've been carting around for the last 20 years will work. Um, with repeater linking, um, you, the nice thing about the, that with All-Star is you do not need the central network to initiate any linking between the repeaters. Um, it is very easy to script announcements, clocks, weather alerts, um, more. I mean, basically, if you can turn it into a sound file and you know a smidgen of Linux, you can make the repeater basically say anything you want it to say. Uh, Echo Link is an option as a pro. Um, and it supports data modes. Uh, MT632K over All-Star Link can be a very, very powerful um, thing to do. The cons, um, All-Star is not the most friendly tool to administer. It's not terrible and there's fairly decent documentation for it, uh, but you need to be comfortable 
uh, either working with a Linux command line or breaking lots of Linux command line things uh, until you get it dialed in right. Uh, the other con is that Echo Link is an option. Um, uh, if you're a user of Echo Link, you probably like it. If you have to keep Echo Link running, you probably hate it. Um, that's why there's a. Uh, <laughs> that's why all of the uh, barometer net repeater controllers have a link to their net control operators have a link to the website, the secret website that we call the big red button, which is basically forcing the uh, Echo Link node to reboot itself. And it gets used fairly often. <laughs> that sounds uh, like an editorial there, Jason. Just saying. <laughs> it is a fact, Gary. It is an objective <laughs> fact. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if, if Jason and I were co-kings for a day, Echo Link would, uh, it would either not exist or it would be significantly different than it is today. <laughs> it's a great it's idea. Like it may disappear, huh? Yeah, I, it, you know, it's the, the thing it has going for it is it's just so darn convenient, um, you know, on the phones and that it, it works really well for that. But but some of the hoops that you have to jump through on the back end to keep it running are, are a pain in the neck. So, yeah, for sure. And, it, and it's a very outdated architecture. I mean, the way it was built is very 1990s mm -hmm. Internet architecture. And it doesn't appear that there's any continued development or maintenance on it at all. No, the code base has largely been dead for the last six years. Yep. Uses kind of an inferior audio codec, so you don't get the, the audio quality that you get out of other things. Yeah, we, yeah, it's, it's got its issues. Yeah, and unfortunately, it probably is not long. I mean, because if they don't start doing some of updating, you know, the apps on the phones or stuff are going to start to break, so. Yep. Well, I'm not sad to see it go, neither. Yep, it has its issues. Yeah. All right, any other questions on All-Star? So, this... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, my apologies. One real quick one. So All-Star, what you just talked about a minute ago, if you could turn it into a file, is that basically the engine you're using to broadcast the amateur radio news line? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a script that um, it was actually put together by Doug, WA3DSP. Um, and then I did some significant mods on it to, for our purposes. But but exa that's exactly right, Stefan. So at, um, let's see, Newsline kicks off at 7.30. So I think it's at 7.10 or 7.15. The, there's a cron job that runs every night um, that, I guess, let me back up for a minute. So anybody who doesn't know the, the Newsline that we broadcast on 3.9 at 7.30 on Tuesdays before the net, that's completely automated. Like nobody, nobody does that. Um, so the, the Newsline file is recorded every week. Uh, Stefan's one of our hosts for that sometimes. Um, they put that file on their website. At 7.10 on Tuesday night, our Raspberry Pi for 3.9 goes out and runs a little job that downloads that file, um, splits it up into 10-minute segments. It puts the little uh, the uh, CW wait sign that did I did it, that, yeah, did I did it in the middle of it every 10 minutes. Um, and then sticks an ID in it, uh, converts it to the, the ULAW wave format that the Pi likes, and then sits there and waits for 7.30 to come around and then kicks it off and starts playing it. Um, and then once it's all done, it cleans it all up and, and deletes the files and gets ready for next week. So um, once in a blue moon, something goes wrong with that. I don't know, two or three times a year, I suppose, something happens that, uh, that gets in the way of that. But but. Um, you know, 49 weeks a year, Newsline just plays on its own and um, nobody has to do anything about it. And, and that's one of the advantages you get by having a real computing platform as your repeater controller. You know, is you, you can't do that on a Cat 1000, what, what we did. You know, you can do parts of it, but, um, you know, once you have a real Linux computer in the mix, the, the sky's kind of the limit. Um, it, it does just about everything. Another example, Stefan, is 
Uh, if you've heard on 3.9, the weather alerts, they come up when there's warnings and watches. So the way that works is I wrote a script that goes out um, every four minutes to the NOAA uh, website and pulls down, they have an XML file that lists the weather warnings and alerts for by zone. So it takes those and parses them up. And if there's any alerts, it figures out which one is the most severe alert. So for example, if there's a tornado warning and a severe thunderstorm watch, it will only play the tornado warning alert. Uh, it announces it by the county that it's looking for and then sticks it on the tail message. And then when the alert disappears, it, it clears that out. And you know that's another example where you could probably glue something like that together on a conventional controller, but you know you'd end up doing it with a pie anyway, probably at the end of the day. So lots of upsides to to having a computer. Thanks for sharing. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Um... Just taking a look at the hardware you need. Um, this is not an expensive build by any means. Um, uh, this uh, this build actually, Stefan, uh, you brought up the RA. Um, this one does use the RA40, which is kind of the one we've been recommending to people now. Um, just because it's equivalently functional to the DMK and about 30 bucks cheaper. Uh, <clears throat> for All Star, uh, recommending a Raspberry Pi 3B kit. Um, I would not get a four yet, even though the four has been out for, I don't know, 12 to 18 months now. Um, some of the software in the all-star world just isn't quite ready for it yet. So stick with a Pi 3B. Um, that's the, a complete kit. Assuming you need a case, hink, sink, power supply, and everything is going to run you about 50 bucks. You need a micro SD card. Um, I put this on here, it's a trivial cost, but the one thing to be really clear about, and that goes for this, and we talk about PyStar, is do not buy a cheap SD card to save two bucks. Um, you need a good class 10 high write cycle SD card. Um, it's often very tempting to pull one out of the drawer that you used in your digital camera for the last 10 years and slap it in a repeater in a pie, uh, but you're gonna be sad in about six months. <laughs> so, um, and then the master's communication, the RA40, I think I said, I think they have an RA45 now. Um, the RA40 plus the case, which uh, there's a nice little plastic case that you can buy it in, uh, will run you 65 bucks um, ship, ship to your door. Um, now that is in a, the, the master's communication ones are an assemble it yourself uh, board. Um, you can pay them to assemble it for I think 20 bucks. Um, it is a quick assembly. I think I assembled it in less than an hour. I mean, it's all through whole components. There's nothing, you don't have to worry about surface mounts or anything weird like that. It's all through whole components. They give you everything, they give you instructions. You start with the lowest profile pieces and work your way up. It's, it's a quick build. So to put together a, a Pi controller, you're looking at about $122 out the door. Um, interfacing with repeaters, um, <clears throat> there are many vendors um, that will have a pre-made interface cable for on the one side that plugs into whatever repeater you have or radio you have. Um, and you, you know, sometimes it'll have a nine pin or a 25 pin. A lot of times it'll come with a loose pigtail. Um, what, what, what I've liked to do, um, unless we're 100% done and baked, uh, you can go on Amazon and you can buy um, breakout boards for the different pinouts which are basically the adapter and then little headers with screws. So you can tin the wire and slide them into the headers and <laughs> tighten them down with screws. Um, and then, you know, at the, the very last step is once you're all done with that, then you can solder up a, a final connector. Um, but don't underestimate the amount of fiddling with, um, with, <laughs> with grounding and wire shielding and stuff you're gonna do while building a repeater controller. Um, you can always build a custom cable. Um, pretty much John and I always build a custom cable. 
um, just because we buy <laughs> we we buy the adapters in bulk at this point. Um, you know, a, a box of DB9 connectors is ten bucks, and the shells are five dollars. Um, and I had we have more cable thanks to a, a generous donation from the dumpster at First Energy after a building wiring project. I think John and I have enough. Um, copper kit building wire to last us for the rest of our natural lives. Um, yeah. But um, all you need, you need six lines, audio in and out, push to talk, ground, um, COS detect, and a CTSS detect. Um, and then like you saw in the, um, in some of the block diagrams, like with the, with the 3.9 machine, you know, we've taken to building out the outboard, like the CTCSS and the squelch decoders. You don't have to do that. You can use that as it comes directly off the repeater. You just got to make sure you can pull all of the, uh, you just had to make sure you can pull all of the signals that you need off of it. Um, and pretty much every repeater um, and most radios can be lightly modified to connect. I think pretty much every repeater can be modified to do this. Um, the tricky part with radio, with like a mobile radio is to grab the COS and the CTSS detect line um, or, you know, you can do it with one line if, it, you know, if you can graft it on. But in a lot of cases, then you're talking about like pulling the cover off and finding the right pin on some logic chip on the board from the service manual and things like that. You can do it. Um, just your difficulty in doing it increases a little bit. Interestingly enough, one of the most interesting ways to do this is with the old Motorola radiuses and max tracks, because you can program uh, the pins and all of the pins are exposed. Um, so as we saw in this, in the things last week, uh, we have a number of repeaters that are just um, uh, Motorola radiuses strapped together. Although I think now we're moving on to CDM 1250s finally. So we've, we've upped a generation, <laughs> we've upped a generation in our hardware. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're into the nineties now. <laughs> yeah. So that is all-star in a nutshell. Is there any questions about the analog all-star repeater? Going once, going twice, gone to Pi Star. All right, so Pi Star um, is again a Raspberry Pi based system. Um, what Pi Star itself is is a software platform. Uh, it's a it is a specially built Linux operating system with software on top of it, um, and its main goal is to talk not to a radio necessarily, uh, but to a MMDVM board. So MMDVM is a project that's been going on for a number of years now to implement the digital radio protocols in a microcontroller. Um, so we're talking about uh, DSTAR, uh, DMR, System Fusion, P25, NXDN, um, they have POXAG paging. And I feel like I read they were adding another one. I can't remember if it was Tetra. Um, yeah, I did. I can't remember what mode it was, but you're right. There was something that they're adding in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is a multi-protocol decoder board. Um, and, and its goal is to sit between the Pi and the radio, very similar to the... Um, sound card except it's not passing it's not doing anything with audio per se all it's doing is passing correctly determining which digital mode it's hearing and then passing that digital mode onward in or out of the network that you have it connected to um pi star is a very easy to use system the directions are excellent you basically flash the SD card and it has a web interface and you do most of the standard things you want to do through the web interface. Um, the newest versions of Pi Star um, can transcode between the compatible codecs. So all of the digital modes that use the, um, I think it's called AMBI 2000 uh, chip, which is DMR, uh, Eric will jump in here and correct me. Uh, is it AMBI Plus or AMBI 2000? But it, the DMR, System Fusion, and I think P25 and NXDN all use the same 
audio compression vocoder with different data frames around it. Um, so those can all be intermixed together simply by watching the data and pulling the metadata off of the audio packets and then sticking the new metadata back on the audio packets. Um, the downside to that is that the PyStar itself can't influence any of the audio. Uh, you can't do any of the announcements or anything like that because you can't, well, you could theoretically, I suppose, but in general, you can't, you can't just play a WAV file. You have to have something that can encode the audio, which is usually a hardware chip. So this is an example. This is the WWKY. This is the 442-275 machine. Um, the radio itself is a Kenwood TKR850. Um, if you'll recall, about a year and a half ago, our uh, 820 had finally decided that it was time to retire. Um, so uh, we replaced it with a TKR850. Um, the interesting thing about doing digital and this is what makes it appealing for a lot of different kinds of radios, is note that you do not need a COS or a CTSS detection line. Um, basically, um, what happens is the DV MM DVM modem, and we, we personally recommend the STM32, which is um, from repeaterbuilder.com. Uh, it is always listening to the audio. There is no concept of, um, breaking the squelch with a tone per se. Um, it is sitting there, it is sitting there waiting to hear a valid decode of the digital of the digital transmission. And then the Raspberry Pi running Pi Star kicks in when it receives that signal and you know does whatever you you programmed it to do. Um, so the nice thing about this is to to set up a um, STM, you basically only need to be able to do transmit and receive audio in a push to talk. Um, which puts it in which puts it in realm of basically any radio in the world. Um, you have to fit a little, little bit with the audio levels if you're going to use like a hand mic port uh, or something like that, um, but it's very doable uh, to do it that way. Um, some pros and cons of Pi Star. Um, it's very easy to deploy with basic computer skills. Like I said, you basically uh, flash the software onto an SD card, stick it in the Pi. It starts, it actually starts with like a wireless port and you log into it and everything is web driven. Um, as I'm, I'm not gonna hash this again, but you don't need require, you don't need the COS, COR detection. So your home brewing isn't limited to radios that you can easily get a hold of that pin. Um, and it's, it's very scalable. So the Pi Star guys did a fantastic job developing this. Um, you can do a little tiny simplex hotspot to a full repeater. So uh, 275 uh, WW8TF 442.375 uh, uses this. Uh, uh, KE8LDH, our other repeater in Akron, um, 442.5125 uses this. Uh, the Worcester machine that we helped them convert, 443.175 uses this. And there's a lot of other people out there who are doing this as well. Um, some cons, um, the modes can't necessarily talk to each other without transcoding. Um, you know, we've solved that problem as we have a fully transcoding reflector. So DMR, DSTAR and System Fusion can all talk to each other, but that's a whole different, <laughs> that's a whole different presentation. Um, it's so, but standalone modes, they can't talk to each other. Um, some modes don't function well without their supporting network. Um, and, and Eric, before you unmute again, <laughs> we're talking about Pi Stars with, uh, with um, Brandmeister networking support. Um, there is a little bit of work going on with data transmissions. Um, there's a project called DRATS, which uh, will send some data over DSTAR. And is it System Fusion, John, that's starting to have some picture? Some picture yeah, modes. Yeah, you can do uh, right. You can do pictures over Fusion. It's got some compatibility issues with Pi Star. We've been finding, but yeah, it at least works. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, that's that's a big con. You know, like the MT sixty three two K over uh, All Star is a really big win. 
And mm -hmm. we did try, we've tried heartily to do MT63 over these protocols. But really at the end of the day, what happens is, is the vocoder, um, the vocoder just, it's, it's designed for human speech and it just doesn't pick up the audio nuances that you need uh, to translate MT63. Um, again, a recommended hardware build kit, um, a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, you can do a Pi 4 now, um, actually Pi Star 4.1, um, which has no, <laughs> with the, the 4 has no relation to the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, but with Raspberry Pi, with, um, excuse me, with Pi Star 4.1, you can now use a Pi 4 kit. Um, micro SD card, again, the same thing. Don't cheap out on the micro SD card. A really good Samsung Class 10 um, multi, you know, many, many right cycles SD card. Uh, and then uh, usually you want to get a Pi hat. Um, so with Raspberry Pis, if you don't know, there's this big GPIO header that sits on the end of a Pi and the Pi hat is literally a, <laughs> you stick it right on the top of the Pi like a little hat. Um, the one that we really like and have been very, very pleased with um, is built off of the STM32 microcontroller um, that's sold by the repeaterbuilder.com guys. Um, it is a really, really nice, board. If you've ever played around with um, like the DV Mega Simplex boards and stuff like that, you can run into some multi-protocol issues where, you know, you have to key up for a really long time before it decodes you and some of those kind of things. Um, we have abused the STM32. We, we enabled all four, all four modes we had as a radio. Uh, Eric uh, WD8KNL has a P25 radio. Uh, that we did some testing with, and it is uh, instantaneous. Uh, I, so I can't see what yeah, you're showing. Go, oh, yep. there we go. Yeah, so Stefan's got a pie hat on there. So, um, and so the, the 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 really nice thing about the STM32 is its decode and encode speed is very very fast, and its mode switching is very very fast, which is really nice in that kind of board. It's a bit on the pricey side comparatively at 110 to some of the other boards, um, but it is really nice. And, and, and it is a pure play microcontroller. It is not an RF board like the uh, some of the DV Megas and the blue DVs and things like that. I mean, this is, this is really a interface board designed to plug directly into a radio. So out the door, you're looking about $167. Again, interfacing cables, um, yeah, there's some pre-made cables that you can buy from Repeater Builder for the Bridgecom BCR series. Uh, they have cables for the Yaesu DR1s and 2s. Um, you can't build this on a 2, um, uh, so don't even try. Uh, Kenwood, the TKR, the X, the 850, 750s, they have a cable for that. And of course, the good old Motorola Max Track Radius CDM that that 16 pin Motorola interface, they have cables for all of those. Again, custom cabling, it's it's a DB9, D sub mini DB9. Uh, you need four wires, audio in and out, push to talk and ground. Basically any radio can be pressed into service to build this. Um, any questions about PyStar? All right, um, I'll talk about this one real quick just because this is a topic that's <laughs> near and dear to our hearts. Um, there are a lot of people uh, or clubs really who, I don't know what, five or six years ago now went out and bought the um, System Fusion DR1X repeaters uh, because Yesu was basically trying to saturate the market uh, to get System Fusion to take off. Um, so a lot of clubs went out and bought DR1Xs because they were cheap, um, but they're not really the best repeater. <laughs> um, primarily their squelch system is very bad. Um, so uh, one of the things that John and I have done some pretty good experimentation with is modifying DR1X repeaters to be both all-star and 
uh, Pi Star repeaters. Um, we got interested in this topic because um, that's what WARC, the uh, Wayne Amateur Radio Club, asked us to do was to help them put Pi Star on their DR1X repeater. And then it was sort of a never ending rabbit hole of all of the fascinating, <laughs> all of the fascinating history of a very short repeater. Um, basically, there's three versions. There's a original DR1X, which is if you want to do Pi Stars, the one you want. Um, but those had a lot of issues that uh, basically ended up in a factory recall. And if you sent it back, you got a factory refurbished version, or if you bought it new later on, you got a what's called the FR version in you know in a lot of amateur circles. Uh, and then they came out with the DR2X. Uh, the DR2X is a much better repeater than the DR1X was, um, but it also costs a lot more. Um, the nice thing about the DR1X is the original one, if you don't have the FR version, is it is essentially two Yesu FTM 400s grafted together with a little controller board in them. Um, they are very, very customizable and modifiable uh, on a modern platform. Um, so if you if you have uh, a, you know, if, you know, I know, I know the, I guess I'm saying this for the uh, the recording of posterity, but if you have an original FR um, uh, repeater um, that has the 1.0 or the 1.1 firmware, um, and it doesn't list the DSP version on the display screen, that is a very customizable repeater that is just crying out to be built in a product, either um, we've done both. So we've done Pi Star graftings onto this and we've done analog graftings. Um, I have a, a entire 1U rack mount kit that will convert the DR1X into a, 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 um, a, a analog, a all-star analog based repeater with a DCS um, and my core squelch. Um, that's what's going to be 146.685 if we ever can, <laughs> if we can ever get the city of Rittman to let us climb the uh, water tower again. So that's just a, a quick comment. I know uh, we, we had made these slides originally for uh, the Maslin Club because they had DR1Xs and they were interested in doing some modifications. So that was how we ended up uh, doing that. Um, so questions to ponder, you know, Sarah's kind of already been down this road, um, but for others who might be thinking about converting repeaters, um, you know, we've put together some questions to ponder. Um, who are your users and what radios do they already have? Um, digital is exciting um, and DMR with the, uh, um, the, the, the fairly inexpensive influx of the import radios has gotten a lot of traction lately. Um, but the question is, you know, what radios do people already have? Um, is there a big group of people out there who maybe have ICOM D-Star radios who have never used them? Um, or do people really want to buy new radios? Those kind of things. Um, what's the core group going to use and be able to support? Because a repeater is only going to be as good as the people who talk on it. So do you, is there enough mass to get people to help each other program a DMR radio or a system fusion radio, things like that? Uh, another question is, what's the goal? Uh, are you looking for network connectivity or are you looking for one of the digital modes? Um, the digital modes have a lot of appeal for a lot of the international reflectors and the national reflectors and things like that. Uh, but again, you know, if you're looking for network connectivity, uh, All-Star might be a better choice because you know, there's a lot of uh, analog FM that's out there. Um, the other question that's always important to ask is how does this move play into retaining and attracting hams? As we covered it in the first part, uh, repeaters, you know, are not going to return to their heyday. Um, you know, cell phones are here to stay; they're not going away. Um, so, really, the question is: is what 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 what's going to be attractive about your conversion process? Are you looking to provide? Uh, emergency communications? Are you looking to provide a playground for people who have all these different modes who want to try them? So Sarah converted 275 on the playground theory. Um, we have a lot of members who had D-Star radios. We had a lot of members who used System Fusion. We had a lot of DMR users. 
Um, we wanted to provide a way for all of those different players to be able to do something with those radios. What's shaken out was the largest portion of traffic on 275 is now System Fusion, um, which was not, <laughs> which is not what I think we would have expected going into it. Um, but there's a core group of System Fusion users now who are on 275, which is great. And that's the point, right? Who, who, are, who are your users? Um, and then the other question is, is, you know, how concerned are you with survivability? Are you a hardcore MCOM group or is this a repeater that you've built as a labor of love to allow the people to talk to each other? There's different considerations and you have to think about what your upstream dependencies are. Um, and Sarah's, you know, we've done this. Um, uh, you know, how do you do it? You know, education of your club, you know, th this is all an educational and learning thing. Um, you know, some recommendations are to standardize on a platform and have some basic radio recommendations. Uh, what we found with the Sarah repeater uh, is a lot of people are using uh, uh, the FT3s and the uh, FTM400s. So, you know, that's, that's a kind of a standardization there. The Wayne guys, the Wark, uh, they've really standardized on DMR using uh, the any, was it John, is it the any tone, the 868? Is that what they all started buying? Uh, it's the uh, Alenco, the DJ the Alenco. five, I think it is, or yeah, the little Alenco uh, DMR handheld. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, education is really key. Um, obviously, with COVID right now, <laughs> this has kind of fallen by the wayside. But uh, there's a lot to be said for having a programming clinic. Um, I know when John and I were helping the Wayne people, especially. Um, we went down to set up the repeater, and I ended up doing a lot of the repeater setup, and John um, very sacrificially um, basically went into radio programming mode <laughs> and was loading DMR plugs for everybody. Yeah, we um, loaded a lot of code plugs that night. There was a lot of code plug loading that night. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, having a programming clinic both to help people load and how to teach people how to program their ones, especially DMR, which is kind of complicated to program. Um, that's really helpful. Um, and the other thing is you want to have consistent naming and terms and setup. Um, you know, consistent terminology is key. Each of the modes has sort of their own terminology, whether it's what the difference in D-star between a REF and an XRF and a DCS reflector are, uh, or um, in system fusion, is it a room or a gateway and does it matter? Uh, with DMR, you kind of have all of the arbitrary naming of, you know, what's Ohio statewide mean, those kind of things. So standardization of terms and technologies is really important. So just kind of as an example, um, the, Wayne, the Wayne Amateur Radio Club and Wayne Aries with DMR, um, regardless of whatever radio and whatever, whatever other programming they put into their radios, um, they've standardized on one, um, I guess this is a, uh, what, a um, zone. They've standardized on one zone that has a consistent channel naming convention that they've built that's the Wayne, the Wayne County zone. Um, so that has the Sarah and the Worcester machines. Um, and then basically the Wayne, the Wayne Aries people can say, okay, everyone go to WOO DMR1, because that's where we're operating on. And then everybody knows exactly what you're talking about there. Um, I don't know, it looks like we lost Doug. I was gonna ask him to talk about his experiences with that. But, um, you know, that's, you know, standardization is really key with some of, with a lot of this. So that is pretty much the end of the talk. So I guess the question is, what questions can we answer for everybody? Anybody so got, at all? So I got one and it's not a big thing. I just was a quick a quick throw out there. So that board that I showed the 25 compared to the 40, that's just a little bit more audio in the 40 board that you can control, right? Otherwise it does everything. Um, so the, the master's communication boards, they have a matrix on their website of what the different pieces do. Um, 
there's um, basically the biggest the biggest differences are um, the trim the tram they have different pots for dealing with um, the audio levels. Some of the higher ones have a 10 to 16 volt amp if you need to amplify the signal. Um, the latest one I just looked it up here is the RA42. That actually has a CTCSS encoder for your audio out. Um, and then they, they have some different status LEDs and um, I don't, they support having EEPROMs. I'm not sure what you'd want to do with an EEPROM, but apparently someone wants it. So they put an EEPROM on there. Um, and then some of them have the ability to add like a low pass filter. Right. And then I noticed they have the digital ones too, the, but that's probably not, but that would be just to hook to digital radios. Correct? Like the DRA models, or is that something different? Just curious. Um, so the DRA, I think those are the ones that they have that are that, that plug in for, those are sort of like the, um, I think those are the custom modules that they have where like you buy the one for whichever one and it's just kind of a little tiny module that you plug into the back of a radio. Um, I think that's more about low cost portability rather than like, you know, a really robust analog system. Okay, cool. Appreciate that, Jason. Thank you. People are dropping like flies, I see. <laughs> any other questions that anybody has from any of this? All right, well, thanks guys for attending. Yeah, thanks Appreciate very much. It. Thank you both. Appreciate that. Running it a second time, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, Jason and John, I wanna uh, again say thank you for you guys picking the ball up and uh, uh, helping us uh, get over this goal line of uh, November. Um, 